The year is 1692, a time when the New World is still shrouded in mystery and danger. The setting is Salem Village, Massachusetts, a small, tight-knit community on the edge of the untamed wilderness. The villagers live simple yet demanding lives. Life is harsh with the ever-present threats of disease, hardship and conflict with Native American tribes. The villagers are constantly on edge, wary of the unknown dangers that lurk beyond their borders. The villagers are deeply religious, their lives governed by strict Puritan beliefs. Every action, every thought is measured against the rigid moral code of their faith. Central to their worldview is the constant battle between God and the devil, a struggle they believe plays out in their daily lives. This belief shapes their every decision and interaction. In this atmosphere of fear and piety, a dark chapter is about to unfold. The villagers' fear of the unknown is about to be exploited in the most terrifying way. The winter of 1692 is particularly brutal, with biting cold and relentless snowstorms. The villagers struggle to survive the harsh conditions. As the days grow shorter and the nights colder, a strange illness begins to grip the village. The symptoms are unlike anything the villagers have seen before. Young girls, beginning with Abigail Williams and Elizabeth Paris, exhibit bizarre behaviour. They scream, contort their bodies and fall into fits. They suffer fits, contort their bodies and scream uncontrollably. Doctors are baffled, unable to provide any explanation or cure. Fear takes root in the hearts of the villagers. Whispers of witchcraft begin to circulate. The villagers, already on edge, start to suspect that dark forces are at work in their midst. The first accusations of witchcraft target those on the fringes of society. Tituba, a slave in the Paris household, becomes an easy scapegoat. Sarah Good, a homeless beggar known for her sharp tongue, and Sarah Osborne, an elderly woman struggling with poverty, are also accused. These vulnerable women, already ostracized, are subjected to intense scrutiny and pressure. Under duress, Tituba confesses to practicing witchcraft. This confession sends shockwaves through the village. Fueled by fear, suspicion, and the belief that the devil is at work in their midst, the accusations escalate. A terrifying chain reaction is set in motion. What began as whispers now escalates into a chorus of accusations. More and more people, many of them women, find themselves accused of witchcraft, with the accusations spiraling out of control, a special court is established in Salem to address the crisis. The Court of Oyer and Terminer, tasked with identifying and punishing witches, convenes in June 1692. The trials are presided over by magistrates with little legal training and a firm belief in the reality of witchcraft. The accused are subjected to humiliating examinations, forced to undergo physical tests intended to reveal the devil's mark. They are interrogated relentlessly, pressured to confess and to name their accomplices. Fear and paranoia grip the courtroom. The lines between accuser, accused, and witness blur. Justice is elusive in this climate of fear and suspicion. The Salem Witch Trials are populated by a cast of characters whose lives become tragically intertwined. This dark chapter in history is marked by fear, superstition, and a fervent belief in the supernatural. The young accusers, known as the afflicted girls, wield immense power. Their claims of being tormented by witches create a wave of hysteria that sweeps through the community. Their testimony, often based on dreams and visions, carries significant weight in the courtroom. The mere accusation of witchcraft is enough to ruin lives and reputations. Abigail Williams, Elizabeth Paris, Anne Putnam Jr., and Mercy Lewis become central figures in this dark drama. Their accusations lead to the arrest and trial of many innocent people. Among the accused, some stand out for their defiance. They refuse to confess to crimes they did not commit, even under the threat of execution. Rebecca Nurse, a respected elderly woman, maintains her innocence despite intense pressure. Her steadfastness becomes a beacon of hope for those who believe in her innocence. Giles Corey, an octogenarian farmer, refuses to plead guilty or not guilty, enduring a gruesome death by pressing. His last words, more weight, become a symbol of his resistance. These individuals become symbols of resistance against the injustice of the trials. Their courage in the face of overwhelming odds inspires future generations to stand up against tyranny. Presiding over the trials are figures like Judge Samuel Sewell and magistrates John Hathorne and Jonathan Corwin. These men hold the power to decide the fates of the accused. These men, driven by a combination of religious zeal and a desire to maintain order, 
play a pivotal role in shaping the course of events. Their decisions are influenced by the prevailing fear and paranoia of the time. Their decisions have lasting consequences, both for the accused and for the legacy of the trials. The Salem Witch Trials serve as a cautionary tale about the dangers of mass hysteria and the importance of due process in the justice system. One of the most disturbing aspects of the Salem Witch Trials is the reliance on what becomes known as spectral evidence. This form of evidence, based on dreams, visions, and other supernatural experiences, is admissible in court. Accusers claim to see the spirits or specters of the accused attacking them or others. This reliance on spectral evidence creates a climate of fear and paranoia. Anyone can be accused based on the flimsiest of evidence, a dream, a rumor, or a perceived slight. The accused have no way to defend themselves against these intangible accusations. The very nature of spectral evidence makes it impossible to disprove, leading to a miscarriage of justice on a grand scale. As the trials drag on, doubts begin to surface. Some prominent figures, including Reverend John Hale and Increase Mather, the president of Harvard College, express concerns about the validity of the accusations and the use of spectral evidence. They urge caution and restraint, fearing that innocent people are being condemned. These voices of dissent, however, are initially drowned out by the tide of fear and hysteria. The trials continue, claiming more victims, but the seeds of doubt have been sown. As the trials reach their peak, a growing number of people begin to question the validity of the accusations and the fairness of the proceedings. The tide is beginning to turn. The tide turns and the trials subside. The turning point in the Salem Witch Trials comes in October 1692, when Governor William Phipps, responding to growing concerns about the trials, intervenes. He dissolves the court of Oya and Termina and orders a new court to be established, one that will not rely on spectral evidence. This marks a decisive shift in the course of events. The new court, while still influenced by the prevailing beliefs about witchcraft, is far more skeptical of the accusations. Trials continue into 1693, but the intensity diminishes. The grip of fear begins to loosen. The hysteria that has gripped Salem for over a year finally begins to subside. Aftermath and apologies, seeking atonement. In the aftermath of the trials, a period of reflection and soul-searching begins. The Massachusetts General Court, recognizing the injustices that have occurred, overturns the convictions of those found guilty of witchcraft. Financial restitution is offered to the families of the accused. Several figures involved in the trials, including Judge Samuel Sewell, publicly apologize for their roles in the events. They acknowledge the mistakes that were made and express remorse for the suffering that was inflicted. These apologies, while coming too late for the victims, represent an important step towards acknowledging the injustices of the past. The underlying causes were a complex web. The Salem Witch Trials, a dark chapter in American history, are a stark reminder of the dangers of mass hysteria, religious extremism, and the use of flawed evidence. Understanding the underlying causes of this tragic episode requires examining the complex interplay of social, economic, and political factors, the harsh conditions of life in colonial Massachusetts, the ever-present threat of disease and conflict, and the strictures of Puritan society created a climate of fear and anxiety. Economic rivalries within the village, as well as anxieties about the changing relationship with Native American tribes, further fueled tensions. In this environment of fear and uncertainty, accusations of witchcraft provided a convenient scapegoat for a community grappling with forces it could not understand or control. The enduring legacy and the lessons learned from Salem. The Salem Witch Trials continue to resonate centuries later, serving as a cautionary tale about the dangers of intolerance, the power of fear and the importance of due process. These trials which led to the execution of 20 people and the imprisonment of many more, highlight how quickly reason can be overshadowed by panic and suspicion. The events of 1692 remind us that even in societies that value justice and fairness, the potential for mass hysteria and the abuse of power remains a constant threat. The trials were fueled by a combination of superstition, fear, and a desire to find scapegoats for unexplained events, showing how fragile our social fabric can be under pressure. Today, Salem stands as a site of remembrance and reflection. 
The town has transformed its dark past into a powerful educational tool, offering insights into human behavior and the consequences of unchecked authority. Tourists flock to the town to learn about the trials, visit historical sites and grapple with the complexities of this dark chapter in American history. Through museums, guided tours and reenactments, visitors gain a deeper understanding of the social dynamics and personal tragedies that defined this period. The legacy of the Salem Witch Trials serves as a stark reminder of the need for vigilance in safeguarding individual rights, the importance of critical thinking, and the dangers of allowing fear and prejudice to guide our actions. It underscores the necessity of questioning authority and ensuring that justice is not compromised by irrational fears or societal pressures. Please like and subscribe to the channel.